We're here to increase our collective understanding of how great cities are shaped. We believe everyone has a role to play in urban design. This is a space where we can learn from international examples and discuss issues relating to built form, the distinctiveness of cities and how we feel connected to place. We can be curious and open-minded. We can all learn and grow. So, let's get to it, Geelong. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our ninth installment in the Designing to Learn webinar series. My name is Leila Farahani. I'm the coordinator of urban design at the City of Greater Geelong. This is an educational webinar series to help demystify how cities are designed. It is brought to you by Revitalizing Central Geelong, a partnership between the City of Greater Geelong and the Victorian government to realize the incredible potential of this city. We want the whole community to be better able to engage in the process of shaping our city. I would also like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people as the traditional owners of these lands and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The format of this webinar will be two 10 minutes presentations by our wonderful guest speakers, followed by a 30 minute question and answer. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat at the bottom of the screen during the talk. This is an educational webinar series, so we will focus on questions that improve our understanding of urban design. And please don't forget, this session is being recorded. Today's topic is why great streets make great cities. Most of us probably don't give parking much thought beyond where is one when it's needed. But few things are as influential on how a city develops. So to help us better understand the implications of parking, we have two fantastic presenters and panelists today. I'll first introduce Stephen Ber uh, Ber uh, Berges. Stephen is a leading contributor to the planning, design, and development of livable cities. Director of Complete Streets, PTY LTD. Stephen brings 30 years experience as an engineer and urban strategist to his understanding of creating resilient livable cities. Over to you, Steve. Thank you very much. I'll just quickly share my screen, hopefully quickly. Perfect. So, uh, good day, everybody. Look, we're going to talk about streets, kind of concentrating on regional places, and also concentrating on central cities of regional places. But you know, feel free to ask questions about mixed use or living streets in all sorts of places because they're all related and they're all very interest top, interesting topics in and of themselves. But main streets in particular, they're, they're kind of the front doormat of your city. Um, you know, people come, oh, I've gone to a new place, I'll find, they'll seek out the centre and they'll kind of decide quite quickly if they like it or not. If I'm going to move here permanently, will I take the job? Will I stay for an extra night? Uh, and that forms quite quickly. So if your centre and the main streets in your centres aren't inviting, clean, green, calm, safe, exciting, livable, all those things at once, then, you know, in this competitive environment for investment and all sorts of things, it, like you kind of get behind in the race. Streets are the real lifeblood of those centres. They're more important than the roads and how you get there or the buildings. I know the architects are going to go cranky about that, but it is what it is. Uh, and, it, you know, street festivals, all this sort of stuff. The streets are really the real lifeblood. And believe it or not, making great streets is kind of pretty easy, but we're we seem to almost deliberately muck them up. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. Streets make up a massive percentage of public space in our cities. And, and in the streets, there's kind of only two real sort of public functions you have to worry about. One of the things that happens in streets is we move 
And the other one is that we exchange. So movement, you know, this is where your cars and your bikes and where you park the cars and how you get buses through and also how people move through when they're not in a car. It's all part of the movement system. And that costs you money because there's a big drain. If you think about, you know, your particular city's budget, how much of it goes into movement, it's very, very costly. And we'll talk about that more specifically in a minute. So the bit you need left over in streets, when you take away the movement space, the exchange space is how you make that money back. So if you're in your street design, particularly your main streets, if you haven't got this balance right, if you've got too much space dedicated to movement and not enough space dedicated to exchange, you've got too much money going out, and not enough money coming in, and it's too hard to get cities to work like that. This slide's pretty interesting. And Weirdly enough, you can't get Australian data on this. So this is a, a Canadian cities. Um, and weirdly, I think the numbers for us would be worse than this as we've got more to do with less money. But uh, everyone sort of seems to accept that when I catch the bus, uh, you all are gonna throw in some extra money. So you don't charge me the full cost of the bus. So if I pay a dollar, you guys ship in another dollar fifty. And people kind of get that and accept why even though it's a financial cost, there might be some long-term economic gain in that. So it's probably worth it. What people don't really understand is every, if I drive my car, every time I spend a dollar driving, you all got to throw in $9. It's the most subsidized, publicly subsidized form of transport there is. Even if you include fuel tax and all that sort of stuff, you don't even come anywhere near to covering the cost. So every time someone in your city starts a car, you're all losing money till I turn it off again. So when you make your centers, you've got to make sure you can get people out of their car as soon as you can, keep them out for as long as you can. And if I was a bit mercenary, I'd say, don't let them back in until their wallet's empty. Yeah, because every, all that time they're out of their car, that's your big chance to get your money back. All that money is spent getting them to the destination. One of the other good things to learn about centers and main streets in cities is to, to think about the ones you like. What type of centers do I like? Um, there's data you can get on this. There's a national livability index that you can get for your particular region or city or town. And it tells you, you know, what things in your community are important. And really, so my uh, city in particular, Hobart, where the Complete Streets headquarters is, always big thing, oh, we need more parking, we need more road space, you know, you're killing the city. But then when we dig down into the livability data, of all the 50 attributes people are allowed to choose that are really important in their place, Parking comes 38 out of 50. It's nowhere near as important as you think when you compare it to all the other things that are important, being clean, being green, being safe, being active, being environment, having things to do at night. They're the things that make streets important. That movement bit, the bit that costs you all the money is nowhere near as important as you think it is. Think about your favorite cities. What do they do right? You know, they're not gonna sue you if you steal an idea from another city. You know, like you're allowed to take them home with you take photos, bring them back, get great memories. And if you think about it, you know, all the, uh, uh, ask people, you know, what's your favorite street? What city, what did you like about it? No one ever says, oh, I like the main route through such and such because it had a level of service B and there was hardly any traffic delay. That's not what they like about cities. That's not what they remember. They remember if your place was alive, if you felt safe, it was well looked after, if people were friendly, you could smell bacon sandwiches and fresh coffee and you, it, it's just such a great street you didn't want to go home. That's what people remember. We're not making roads here, remember, we're making streets, they're economic drivers for your city. So is your city the best it can be? Are your streets exemplar? Are people going to go to your town and take photos and say, I went to this town and oh man, you should look, check these photos out. If it's not like that, why isn't it like that? Why didn't you make your streets like that? Well, you know what to do. You got data, you know what people like. They like them to be active. They like to be environment. They like to be able to sit outside. What they don't like is more traffic. So, well, what could you do to fix up this street? I know what this street needs. It needs more traffic in it. Whoever says that? Nobody says that. But yet every time you add a parking space, every time you put a little bit of extra green time on the lights, every time you put an extra slip lane in, Every time you do that, you're attracting more cars to your centre and your community will like it less. If the community doesn't like your centre, if they don't like your streets, oh, I just realised, I think I've got the name of that city. In there. I normally don't put that in the bad ones, but anyhow, we'll battle on. But 
the, the, the better you make it for a car, as humans, we like it less. So if we don't like it very much, we'll go there as, won't go there as often as we should. Like we'll try and, oh, I don't really want to go in there today. It's a bit rubbish. And you get in there and say, look, I'm going to get whatever I have to get done. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to leave. So I stay less time. If I go less often and I stay less time, your city makes less money. You need streets that people said, oh, I'm going to go in there. I haven't really got much to do, but it's such a good place. I'm going to go in anyway. That's how you create active, vibrant streets that make active, vibrant cities. Main streets, clean, welcoming, safe and walkable. All the data tells you that's what people like. So let's just make them like that. Like what would it hurt if we did that? Who wouldn't want a street like that? But every time we kind of fall for this thing, if you've got a core part of your city that's supposed to be main streets, as in the retail, the business, the cultural heart of your city, if you start measuring the quality of that street using a traffic model, there's almost no chance you'll get a good result there. The traffic model is not your friend. It's got to be your slave, not your master. You have to say, look, these are the type of activities I want to have in this street. I want people to be able to walk. I want people to sit. I want people to spend, I want them to shop, I want them to That's great. Then, you find, then maybe you say, well, if I do this in the core, where's all the traffic gonna go? You can use your model to find that out. But what you don't want is your modeler saying, oh, look, I'm sorry, Steve, I can't make the main street like that because my model says there's got to be 20,000 cars walking down, driving down there. If you start from there, it's almost impossible to make a great street and therefore it's impossible to make a great city. Everyone's got one of these type of diagrams in their government town plan somewhere that they think pedestrians are our highest priority and cars are our lowest priority. And but do they follow through on this? So if I do a development application in the center of your city, and I say, look, I'm not really, I haven't got anything in my development application about traffic because I don't really care about it, but this is how the pedestrian is going to access my building. There's almost no place I would get away with that. The first thing someone's going to ask me is, look, you haven't met the minimum car parking rate and you need to do a traffic impact assessment to make sure you don't slow down the traffic. That's basically the same thing as saying, look, I'm sorry, Stephen, unless you cause the minimum amount of environmental and economic damage, I won't give you an approval. We've got to grow out of this. If this is true, if you really believe that humans are important in your city, then you have to start treating your streets like that. You have to start budgeting like that. Don't give any money to the cars if you don't care about them. Give it all to the people to make it a place where they can stick, stop, stay and spend. They can attract investment. They can generate jobs. You know, they're the people who do it. Cars don't do that. They do the opposite. The more cars you have in your town centre, in your city centre, you're just going to suffer more. People won't like it. They won't come. They won't stay and they won't spend. We can fix this. There's plenty of towns that don't quite get this right and they've got too many streets like this one. And a car is like a virus. Like once it gets hold, it's kind of hard to stop generate sprawl development, then it demands road space, then it demands parking space, then it generates sprawl development, then it demands road space, then it demands parking space and you're on the bad hamster wheel. They need space to survive. Everyone that comes into your city, you mostly lose money. So if you give them space, they'll take it and they're hard to get rid of. So don't give them all the space to start. And this is where it sort of starts. Some think people think, oh, parking's a bit of a chicken and egg. I have to do this before I can take parking away. Is not true. Parking is the rooster. Parking is what starts all this nonsense off. If you've got an oversupply of parking, you're going to be in trouble. The worst thing that can happen in your town centre is if I'm leaving home and I say, look, I'm pretty sure I'll get a park in the middle somewhere. And the first two hours are free. So yeah, what the hell I'm going to drive. I drive in, I go around the block a couple of times generating traffic and I find a space really close to where I want to go, really convenient. I race in, I spend my $8.00 race back out to my car and then I go home again. If that behavior is possible in your town, your CBD is just gonna slowly decline. And unless you address that parking issue, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just a traffic generating land use that sucks money out of your town. It discourages walking, it discourages long stays. You've gotta do something about it. When, what we do sort of 
incorrectly is we treat it as a demand-led service, as in people deserve it. So the more they want, the more we're going to give them. And the thing that you get that is that convenience I've talked about. So I can park really close to the thing I want and I can only spend five minutes in town and then I can leave again. But you need people to spend two or three hours in town. So why would you make it convenient for them to get in and out really quickly? It's poor aesthetics. You get bad modal splits. You get no public transport uptake, low pedestrian activity, high traffic volumes, short visits, low span, your developments cost more. Like for that tiny little convenience advantage, look at all the bad shit that happens when you have too much parking. It is a supply-led commodity. Yeah? If you can afford to pay for it, then get some in there. But if you can't afford to pay for it, then you can't have it. I mean, it's slightly less convenient for drivers. So I have probably might have to park two blocks away or I say, oh, look, it's too hard to get a spot in town. I'm going to ride my bike or I'm going to catch the bus in today. But you, all this, you get more mode diversity, you get more pedestrian activity, you get longer stays, bigger spend. Your town looks more vibrant. It looks more active. It's a win, win, win. And you have to get ahead of it. Now, if you haven't figured it out already, regional cities are in a race. Um, you need to attract investment that gets young people to move to your city. And the things that millennials love, and you can break that livability data down to the millennial data set. They're the ones that are going to the future of your city. They're going to start businesses. They spend money in town. They always assume they're going to be rich, so they spend more money than they got. But there's two things that they can't bear. One is they don't want to buy a car. And the second one is they don't want to live in a detached house. So if that's the only choice they've got when they go to your city, you're in trouble because you're forcing them to drive. You're forcing your economy into decline by making people do the less economic thing possible, which is drive a car. You have to get more and more people, particularly millennials, but the next best one are the downsizers. The first of the superannuation generation who've just hosed out their kids. And they finally got five minutes and five dollars to spare and they want to move in close to stuff that they like doing. They want to spend money. But if you say, look, there's no option for them. You've got to keep your house out of the suburbs. Oh, I can't be bothered driving into town tonight. If driving's your only option, your city is in decline. You have to get ahead of it. More traffic in your streets means there's less walkers, less people, less customers. Low speed, it's high profit in your town centre. Streets with low speed. People are more comfortable to stay there. They're more comfortable to cross the road like Brown's Cows, which is important. They'll sit outside. You know, you know the streets I'm talking about. You've all visited them. You've all taken photos of them, brought it back and think, why haven't I got that street here? Width is your enemy. Wide streets discourage walking. They discourage people crossing. You, you're down the road of kind of empty shops and not much walking. There are exceptions to that rule. You have to use a real lot of green space to manage a wide street. But generally speaking, width, is your enemy. But the future isn't decided. If you've got a car dominated center, you can fix it. Any center can be vibrant, green, happy, and healthy. You need to create the environment that you're a human. You know what it's like, places where you would stick, stop, stay, and spend. And that's not a three lane, 60 kilometer hour street with no street tree and no awnings and no shade and skinny footpaths. If, look, if you wouldn't like that as a human, don't inflict it on the rest of your community. Make a street that you would like. There are actually no rules against it. You're allowed to do this. Be brave, listen to your community and make some really lovely places. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Stephen, for your wonderful and informative presentation. Um, next, we have Gerhana Vati. Gerhana is the director of Hansen Partnership. She is an experienced urban designer with over 14 years experience in both public and private sectors. With a sound knowledge of design appraisals, master planning and framework initiatives within Australia and internationally. Gerhana's passion for urban design is driven by her architectural background and her particular interests in how evidence-based design and urban analytic could influence quality decision-making and design outcome in a constantly evolving urban environment. 
Over to you, Gerhana. Thank you, Leila, and thank you everyone for having me. Um, I will share my screen shortly just to get the right slides. Thanks everyone. And I think this is a great follow up from um, Stephen's presentation about the benefits of great streets and, and how they contribute to making great cities. Stephen, I have just done exactly what you've asked. Go to um, those beautiful cities and take photos and bring them home and ask your friends, why haven't we got them here? When I thought about what great streets we have in Australia, first thing that popped in mind, of course, is Smith Street. It is a recognized hipster town, um, but it is also a well-known coolest street in the world. The Times Magazine celebrated it. It is the poster kit of our livable city and Melbourne as the most livable city in the world. So the first question I asked when looking at Smith Street, why? Why is, it, why is Smith Street the coolest street in the world? It doesn't have, you know, six lanes traffic. It doesn't have a boulevard. It is literally a main street. What is unique about Smith Street? And how can we actually unpack that and understand the qualities that make great streets so we can start thinking about them and making decisions that influence that kind of outcome. So what I'm intending to do for the next 10 minutes is invite you on a bit of a world trip around the world and around Australia uh, to see some of the great streets around the world and what attributes and what can we learn from them. The first thing that popped to my mind is this uh, boulevard in Barcelona. Um, it is a 50 meter wide road, and yet it has struck the right balance of movement and exchange in terms of its character, in terms of its presentation. This street still allows the function of a road for movement and cars. It also allows option for traveling, for cycling, and allowing for pedestrian to actually inhabit the footpath that is well equipped with amenity and building activation. What is interesting here is that safety and accessibility is important when each mode of transport are given the right of way. So they don't have a conflict with each other and there is no uh, safety issues with regards to how the two modes of transport actually uh, interact with each other. So at the very basic um, fundamental matter, great streets need to be safe and accessible, not just for cars, not just for uh, pedestrian, but also for other mode of transport. When we look at the sideway of the same boulevard, that same street, we can start looking as a pedestrian. We as pedestrian move at five kilometers an hour. And that's if we walk very fast and we have able bodies. Someone who is probably less able will walk a lot slower and starts to be able to appreciate the kind of architecture, the kind of landscape, the kind of climate, the kind of impact that the, um, the seasonal start to have on us. So in terms of how a, uh, a great streets can function, it requires great surveillance. It requires eyes on the street. What I mean by that is buildings that allow for um, outlook. It allows for the inhabitants to start occupying that the building edges. It allows um, the community to hang out and linger in the public space. And there is a sense of generosity in the design that allows and invite you to want to hang out there. So it's not just about providing a bench. It's not just about providing white food parts. It is about creating urban rooms that allows this sense of invitation and allows for a sense of surveillance so that someone feels safe as they walk through that street. When we talk about street users, we talk about able bodies, we talk about uh, senior population, but we also need to talk about little people. If we are to build a generation which are um, future generations who are more appreciative of sustainable transport and can embrace walking and cycling as a preferred mode of travel, we need to start young. We need to start engaging them at uh, creating streetscape and making decisions of how our streets function so that we don't end up with what I call backseat generation of kids being driven to everywhere, even though their schools or their sports places are not that far off from home. And that also means that parents can trust their kids to be able to, tr to use the public space safely without much um, supervision. That can engage um, in terms of the design outcome. 
the kind of texture, the kind of public arts, the kind of scale of our urban furniture to start relating to little people, not just adults and grown-ups. In Sydney, this is a great example, and this is a street that I really love uh, visiting when I'm in Sydney. It is in Kensington, in um, Kensington Street in Chippendale. Uh, it's a revitalization area, and a lot of the investment from the city of Sydney is actually on the public realm. What's interesting here, though, is that the heritage and the built form and the character of the place is what makes this place special. The public realm itself, the footpath, the street, the lanes are there as the supporting act. So there is distinction between the street as the hero, as the destination that someone visit, but there is also a role for a street to perform as the foundation, as a platform for other events and other activities to happen. Here you can see what we urban designers always use the term of fine grain, and that if we unpack means buildings that are human scale, windows and doors which are relatable to human dimensions, as well as uh, being able to see between inside and outside. So there is a visual connection between what is going on uh, between the two spaces. Sometimes there is a little quirks, like a gap in between buildings, and that starts to create visual connection to something else that invite the sense of curiosity and wonder uh, that allows people to actually want to traverse through and want to spend time within that space. The same street that changed at night. This is really interesting. This is a restaurant uh, called Koi in, in the within the same street and it's tucked away behind um, the building line. So you don't see that very easily. But what is wonderful about this, and this is another quality of streets that is often overlooked, is how they engage our senses, not just through the eyes, not just through the ears and hearing through honking and people yelling on the street and getting stressed out, but through smell, how it changes over time, smell of coffee, smell of flowers, um, the kind of lighting that changes, the kind of shadow that changes within the street, it starts to create this different environment that allows people to want to be in that space. Sometimes decoration and street and public arts also allow that kind of streets to change in character. But what is important is to allow the degree of flexibility. Streets often has a defined width, a defined um, infrastructure requirement. It's quite rigid in its, in its form and its physical manifestation. What is important is to allow the flexibility to happen within that. It could be through policy, it could be through community um, push and, and desire in terms of allowing events to spill out onto the street. And if there is demand, there is a way. So this is an example of how the same laneway, which at daytime allow for delivery, freights and, and, and cycling, but throughout certain time of the year, it allows for a different kind of activity and human habitation to happen. Sometimes there's no space. Sometimes, like I said, road space is so limited and there is um, a very uh, challenging ways of how footpath can be expanded over time. So a degree of trial, a degree of expansion within a road space can happen uh, through parklets, um, through expansion of temporary footpath, and you try it and you try and you observe. A lot of cities does this, city of Melbourne does it, and I'm sure city of Zilong does it, in terms of knowing what actually is the best way in dealing with the demand of um, a pedestrian in terms of movement and whatnot. What is important as well in terms of this kind of um, contribution is that great streets contribute to local economy. Stephen talked about this in great length. What's interesting is there's research that says in Hong Kong, I think it was, that talks about public realm improvement contribute to 17% increase in the, um, retail value of, of the streetscape itself because it allows more people to come and visit and spend money, allows more cyclists to come and visit and spend money, um, and allows for more, a longer um, stay within that streetscape. Street, great streets or great uh, public space need to be intimate. So we don't feel like we are exposed to the elements, that we feel safer, um, we feel engaged with the kind of activities that is provided within the built form. What is important then, of course, street design is not just about looking at the street itself. A lot of the time, 
we also need to consider the architecture. We also need to consider the built form response that define that streets. How much setback do we need? Does building need to be built to the street edge? And the kind of quality that it will start to create with regards to our experience within that streetscape. And also, of course, um, the shadow impact um, within that street. Another great experience that I had is actually in Japan. Um, this street doesn't even actually have a proper name. It is called a cat streets. And it is a network of really tight, intimate streetscape that sits behind the main street in Shibuya. And what's fascinating about this place, it, it invites a sense of adventure because it is so unexpected. It is so, to some degree, disorganized that there is a wonderful um, invitation for us as pedestrians to start exploring and trying to find out what else is happening here. And this is, again, the street is no longer about the building. It is about the layers that starts to make that um, experience quite unique. It is about how the building lands to the street, how it, it, it creates edges, and how it invites people to perch over those buildings and starts to inhabit uh, the building frontage. In Bangkok, um, I don't know if for some of those who's been to Bangkok, I'm sure you're familiar with the infamous Skywalk. It, the traffic congestion has got so bad that at some point pedestrian has no longer place within the road itself, that they have to be elevated within a bridge, separated from every active frontages and every buildings that's actually lining them. This project here is quite interesting in its intervention of softening um, the edge of building through landscaping, it has some misting effects that's actually being pumped into the uh, footpath. So it actually starts to create microclimate. It starts to um, create some shading through trees so that pedestrians feel a lot more um, comfortable walking in an environment which is you know, hot and humid. But it also means then there is a greater chance for people to actually go and engage with the shopping center and the shops rather than being separated from the footpaths. So while this is all generous and, and beautiful, there is also economic imperative with regards to delivering landscaping to uh, the success and the viability of this business and the benefit of the pedestrian. Coming closer to home in Gravel Street, uh, Paran, this doesn't used to be um, a shared street. It used to be a two-way access. Um, and the Stonington Council has sought to actually uh, redesign this whole place as a shared zone. It still allows car park, it still allows um, traffic to traverse through. But what is important here is the sense that pedestrian is now given the priority. Importantly about this project is the storytelling elements and the narrative. If we come and look closely to the paving patterns, to the street furniture, to the color choices, there's actually the whole story that's being said here about the place and the history of the place that Gravel Street used to be um, a place where there used to be a lot of tailors um, and clothes, clothes makers and whatnot. So all the furniture and the furnishings start to tell about um, that past and that um, celebra celebrated um, story and use and function of this place. That seating there is actually a huge buttons. Um, some of this is actually starts to behave like a zip. So there's again, whole narrative um, about how public space can contribute to, to the city. Sometimes great streets are not always lined up with cafes. It's not always main streets. Your residential streets can also be great streets and it can be memorable. So the choice of landscaping, the tree selection, the kind of, um, you know, whether it is curb or grass verges, or is it a swale that starts to evoke a different kind of place making element and the kind of character of place. And a great street is always memorable. It could be something that um, uh, triggers a different kind of a uh, memory in us uh, when we think about what great streets look like. Great streets allow events and public expression to, to, to happen. Um, this is of course at the forecourt of the GPO. Uh, and this is I think a wonderful example about how the public realm and the built form starts to talk to each other. There is white footpath that has beautiful and, and quality material. It is close to public transport. So someone who's waiting for the tram can still listen to the um, uh, buskers playing music. 
and the building starts to create steps as it lands into the public space to allow people to hang out and sit and watch each other. So this wonderful mix of unplanned um, activities that actually becomes um, rich elements that make streets inviting places to be in. And we zoom into detail building architecture is important in contributing to the quality and experience of streets. So yes, what we plan and how we plan the kind of uh, cross section of a street is important. The landscape is important as well as how we design shop frontage, um, building frontage. They're all important to the way we wanna be in that street. This example here in Melbourne is a donut shop. That in itself is an attractor, no doubt. Um, but when we dissect this um, elevation, for example, the, the street, the plinth height, I should say, um, is actually um, designed at a seat le seating level, the kind of um, window proportion, the kind of material, it is wood, it is something that is natural that we gravitate towards, the coffee as an attractor and, and smell, this is all contributing elements that invite these people, us, to want to be in that space, to just take a stop, contribute and buy a coffee and hang out and allow other people to see the same thing and be wanting to do the same thing. When we look at um, a different kind of architectural detailing, this is a deliberate move by the architects to uh, create these peep holes. Um, this is actually a recital hall in, in uh, the arts precinct in Melbourne. So inside here is actually a practice room for uh, the orchestra to practice, normally not um, visible to the public, but actually to allow the, um, the, the community to engage with arts and, and uh, the use of this building, creating these peepholes, creating this really interesting architectural um, treatment is something that becomes uh, a contributing elements to the street. It allows the sense of curiosity as a passerby to start engaging with that, um, that use of the function of the building. Sometimes street changes, building changes. Um, this particular building here used to be a residential building. Over time, it starts becoming a hole in a wall coffee shop and it starts to spill out on the street. Seats start to pop up, trees starts to grow and it just becomes a different kind of street and different kind of character. So allowing that to happen through your zoning, through your planning laws, could be something that contribute back to the street. So sometimes to facilitate changes, some policy triggers need to happen. Educational, streets can be educational. Again, this is an example of a great street in Adelaide that is not a residential street. It is not a retail street, but yet there is a really inherently um, valuable asset in terms of what these streets do to the community. It celebrates integrated water management system. It celebrates rain gardens. Even the paving pattern of the street starts to talk about water. Um, the public arts and the play elements engage children to understand water as a valuable resource in, in uh, our daily lives. So there is elements of playfulness, there's element of education, in terms of how our streets can also function. Importantly, and this is why we're here today, is that great streets require great street champions. We are all street champions from decision makers to street users, to landowners, shopkeepers, community members. Some of the projects that we've done um, across Melbourne is to, when we, when we deliver streetscape projects, is that we always create street champion groups they become the eyes, the ears, the owners, the custodian of the streets. Consultants come and go, council officers come and go, the street champions stay and they become the owners. They watch and look after that street. When there is a owners and someone who cares about the place, that place tends to be safe, that place tends to be inviting and they have a high success rate. So if I can just summarize what I've talked about, I think there are 10 criteria that make great streets. They need to be human scale, proportionate to, to our body. It needs to be ver, um, diverse and it has variety. So it doesn't feel boring when we walk along them. It has to have great identity, whether it's through jacaranda trees, whether it's through the public realm treatment, and also needs to consider design detail. It's up to the level of material, paving pattern. 
it contributes to our senses and contributes to our experience. Fundamentally, it needs to be safe, it needs to be equitable. Everyone is welcome in that street. Pedestrian, cyclists, drivers, delivery men, whoever it is, has to be invited in that space. Landscape always softens the space and it is something that we always crave for. Climate, is the street sunny? Is the street windy? It all contributes to how we want to stay in that space. It needs to be educative because streets always changes and we need to always educate ourselves about why different streets work and why it doesn't. Importantly, great streets is all about people and it's all about human experience. That's it from me. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gerhana. That was a wonderful and engaging presentation. Thank you both, Stephen and Gerhana, for the fantastic presentations. We can now open up for some questions. So if you have not already done so, please post your questions in the chat function. Um, I might start with asking one of the questions so that um, we give time to people to um, write their questions in the chat function. Just as a reminder, we are moderating the discussion and we'll focus on those questions that improve our understanding of urban design. Um, Steve talked about cars being the virus and a lot of the cities being very car uh, or the city centers being very car dominated. I was wondering if you have examples of transformational uh, streets that have that were able to kind of change or heal that virus as and change from being very car dominated or car oriented to have more pedestrian oriented and pedestrian friendly streets oh yeah look there's lots of examples of that when you know, Brisbane first put the Queen Street Mall in, the, you know, because that was one of their busiest traffic streets. I think, oh, no, it's going to be a disaster. No, the, you know, that we fixed Swanston Street, same thing. It was a heavily traffic street. How could you possibly kick cars out of there? It's going to cause, oh, it'll never work. And, you know, now streets are not, on, cities are not only expanding from having one or two car free streets, but, you know, I'm working with four, four cities in Australasia that are all making their CBD blocks car free. Not for any lefty greeny buddies. It's because that's how they're gonna make more money. You know, the more cars you put into the middle, the less money you're gonna make. And there's no sort of way around that. It's just a fact. Now, the drivers, able-bodied drivers who could literally walk for miles and everything, they're demanding car spaces right out shop they wanna to go to is kind of the real death rattle for cities, yeah? If you fall for that, you're done. You know, you have to develop a level of maturity to say, look, you know, there will be some people said, oh, I really don't feel like walking a block just to go to the accountant. But when they do that, you know, they walk past and, you know, as Gahana said, you know, the touch, the smell, the sight, think, oh, get distracted. Oh, I'm going to the accountant. Blah, blah, blah. No, oh, but I'm walking past that shop. Oh, better buy some of them to take over the kids. And you run into your friend because you're walking. You're not just dashing into the shop. Oh, I want to have a coffee. Yeah, right, mate. Gets nearly four o'clock. Oh, I want to have a beer. Oh, now I've missed the account. Now I'm late. Now I've got to find a florist on the way home. Like, you know, that incidental spend, incidental activity, the high bump areas, you know, the fine grain thing, it's all to do. It's all to win. And every single time you put a car in there, some of that disappears. And so, you know, you've just got to develop a level of maturity about it. I haven't really got time to talk about it, but I did a small, well, it was a small project in Hobart where the fringe CBD retail centers, where the old big tram stops were, used to have the fish and chip shop and the chemist and a few little things around the tram stop. They're all declining and they all asked for more parking for the city. And we did a project said, right, I will make up your own street then. And when they sort of sat down and figured it out, they all voluntarily took out their own parking because they realized that was the way to make money. Um, that, that report's probably still on the website. So, um, you know, when people are faced with the reality to say, look, do I want convenience or do I want to make money? Because they, they can't have both of those things. Most traders decide that they would rather make money. Um, 
and you know that's that, that's what you have to address and that's that's how you got to tell your story thanks steve that was very comprehensive i'll ask one more question uh from uh gerhana and then go to the uh, audience questions uh Johanna, you talked about um, designing the streets for um, children, but also for old people. How can we manage that design a street that suits an eight-year-old eight as well as an 80-year-old? And also, you know, men and women, people of different color, how, how can we make our streets as inclusive as possible? Good question, Leila. I think fundamentally, the way we design our streets need to make sense. And that um, transcends language barrier. Um, if a street is legible, meaning you can see where you're going or you understand there is a footpath to walk on, these are intrinsically what we understand as human, how we habitate a space. In terms of recognizing different street users from age perspective, we need to recognize that, that different people travel at different speed. So things like, modifying your traffic signal to allow a longer pedestrian crossing. I'm like 160 centimeters. I have very short legs. It took me yonks to cross some streets because I feel like I have to catch, catch the lights. And I can't imagine if there's someone with mobility issues, how they will have to travel some streets, especially those big streets, 50 meter streets, and you have 10 seconds to cross that. That's just not. Um, inviting to children and elderly, in my opinion. In terms of um, gender, uh, I think this is a very interesting topic. And I know Nicole, Nicole, um, uh, Nicole Combs, uh, Nikki Combs from XYX Lab has come and talked to you before about um, gender and cultural sensitivity. So all of that principles make complete sense in terms of how we lit our streets, for example. A lot of street lights are lit from the top and that tend to make women quite unsafe actually because we become a lot more visible in terms of us traveling at night on our own. So some of the um, street lightings and design detail that we incorporate in our street design starts to look at lower lighting um, or up lighting so that there is a, a, a safer perception of the space. Another thing that we always talk about is um, this active frontage. Sometimes planning misinterpret that and say, all right, everything has to be glazed. That's not necessarily always correct because active means there is an engagement. There is human interaction. So sometimes allowing all the shop frontage to be in glass actually limits that because they will use those frontage as storage or display items and whatnot. So perhaps think about some proportion as glazing and some proportion as habitable edges, seating areas, something that actually allows people to enter a greater number of doors and whatnot. So there is, I think, multi-layered elements with regards to how we can create a safer environment for all women, men, young and old. But also there are specific elements that we can start tweaking to address and make those um, who are less able or less more vulnerable, more comfortable in traversing the streets. That was a long-winded answer. <laughs> Thanks, Gerhana. That was wonderful and very comprehensive. Um, I'll now look at the chat and thanks for people who have sent us their questions. I'm looking at James Bryan's um, question about the elephant in the room, car parking. <laughs> I knew that there would be a question about car parking. Um, uh, James is asking about um, how does this perception that um, car parking should be in front of the shops that to make it the most convenient for uh, the customers uh, to basically shop as fast as possible. So how should we navigate those types of discussions when we are removing car parking? Because um, it's sometimes difficult. Um, I was wondering, Steve, if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, look, it's a thing. And, and one of the mistakes we sometimes make is we get ourselves isolated on the car parking issue. You know, we've both talked today about all the massive amount of issues that make a great street. And you have to take all those into context. And like I said, if you look at the national livability data, when you ask people out of all these attributes, um, particularly those ones Gahana talked about, about, you know, 
uh, fine grain on the side, street trees, good walking, good seating. You know, it all puts a smile on your face looking at those delicious photos. Mm. And yet, and no one picks, you know, a six lane street with car parking on the edge and all that. Oh, that's my favorite because I've got to get a car, you know, oh, I'm going to go to Vienna for a holiday because I know I can get car parking there whenever I want. Like, it's just rubbish. It's not a relevant thing. But the trap is this convenience thing where it's said, oh, Steve, you know, your shop's a pain in the ass. Every time I go to your shop, I've got to park around the corner in the next block. But what they don't realize is that every third time they buy something else from somebody else because they got to work for it. You've got to get your customers to walk up to 600, 800 meters from their destination. Otherwise it's too difficult. You know, they don't use up enough exchange pace to pay for their trip. Now, if you think of sort of simple, oh, I've got to have more parking because I'm competing against a Westfield or some sort of shopping center like that. Oh, because I can always get a park at Westfield, which you can. And you can always get a park in most regional cities. It's just the further you put it away, the more money you make. Now, those buggers at Westfield and all the, you know, they are onto that. They don't let you park anywhere near the shop door. They make you park, you go way the hell over there and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. And the average walk at some of those shopping centres, the only one I know sort of off the top of my head is Chermside in Brisbane, which is medium to large. 175,000 square meters or something. Yeah. It's several kilometers. You know, and, and none of the shopkeepers there are saying, oh, look, I'm never going to make any money here because there's not a parking space right outside my shop. The big advantage shopping centers have over Main Street shopping is that they don't have any car parking straight outside the shop. So you have to walk a long way, which means you stay a long time, which means you spend a lot of money. It always looked active. All the things we want in our Main Street they achieve by not letting you park anywhere near the shop front. That's what we should be copying, that behaviour. Get them out of their car as soon as you can, keep them out as long as you can, and don't let them back in until their wallet's empty. Yeah? They've got to do at least three or four things before you let them back in. If you have abundant car parking, it's everywhere and it's free, and you, so you never think of taking another mode to get to the centre. You park really close to where you want to go. You only do one or two things. You jump back. You only spend 15 minutes in town. As a community, you know, as a retail community, you've all lost money because of that. You've got to get out of that habit. And like I said, that, that report on the, the city, Hobart City Council website, I'm pretty sure it's still there about, you know, re, uh, local retail precincts. Just when we put that proposition to shopkeepers, they figured it out and said, ah, I know how to fix my main street. I'm going to take out all this curbside car parking and put in some of the stuff that people like. No one likes more traffic. They like more seating, they like more shade, they like more attractive shop fronts, they like more fine grained shops. That's what they like. So, you know, make your discussion about that and say, so to get this to work properly, my street's got to look like this. That might mean some of the parking's got to go and park around the corner. Doesn't matter. It's not a thing. Don't isolate yourself on the parking issue because even people don't drive say, oh, we should put some more in just in case, who cares? But that's not what it's about. It's not about convenience, it's about stick, stop, stay, spend. Thanks, Steve. That example of shopping malls, I think, really helped us understand um, what you mean. Uh, the next question is also for you. Can you elaborate on which city CBDs within Australia, uh, Australia Asia are uh, going car free? Yes, a couple of them are still keeping their head below water on that, but two ones that are very public about it. Um, Melbourne's starting to turn some of the laneways, they're getting the cars out of them and they're just going to buy osmosis, sneak up and have more and more streets, you know, car free. So the pedestrians enjoy their experience more. They walk further, they stay longer, they spend more. And the other one is the city of Auckland. So they're, they're quite a way down the track with their scheme. And they've invested massively in public transport. You know, they've done all the right things. And, you know, to see that CBD come to life over the last 20 years has been just, that's a really amazing transformation. So, you know, hard work, big investment, I agree, like electrifying the whole train system and all that sort of stuff is a big deal, but they're really reaping the rewards. Now, for the first time since I've been in the profession, which is way too long, white collar migration in that millennial age group goes from Australia to New Zealand now, not the other way around, because millennials like their cities better than ours because you don't have to have a car to live there. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'll ask the next question from uh, Gerhana. Uh, Gerhana, we have a question from Peyron around uh, greenery in our street and looking at 
the capacity that we have in providing streets and the streets width and the balance and proportion, how we can we encourage more uh, greenery in our streets? Thanks, Leila. This is always a, a great aspiration. Every community groups that we talk to about improving public space always want more trees. As we know, trees contribute to urban cooling, it creates a better um, amenity and it looks great. How do we squeeze them in? <laughs> it's always interesting. Um, there are ways in terms of how we shuffle sometimes on street parking. Sometimes we turn uh, angled parking to parallel parking. The community sometimes scream about that um, to allow for more space um, within uh, the street for street trees. And there is always this debate about no one wants lollipop trees. These are like small little tiny trees that doesn't even go to a single story height of building. They want beautiful majestic canopy trees and that creates this boulevard effect, right? And they need space. So a couple of things we always do in, in our streetscape design is firstly, we always attack the car park. Steve always loves this. <laughs> Whether we remove them, if it can't be tolerated, we rearrange and we shuffle them around to create more space for trees. Two, we set back buildings. It may not be viable in a main street, but in residential street, we sometimes um, enforce number of canopy trees within front gardens. So it contributes and provides some shading within the footpath because the footpath do sit between the street and, and the houses and the front gardens. And then sometimes we um, find creative ways in terms of how we find, I'm going to technical detail here about tree cells and substructures and whatnot to allow the roots to grow because we want to make sure those trees will survive. What is the, the rule of thumb for us in terms of um, really good ratio of trees within the street? It's a large tree every 10 meters. Literally every two car park will want to have one tree at a very minimum. Because in effect, when they grow mature, those kind of pictures will start to merge. They will create this biodiversity um, corridor. It creates a more meaningful impact on the street. And it also allows for um, animals to start habitating um, those spaces. When we are close to nature, not just through landscape, but also through um, flora, it is something that will enrich our experience in the street. Thanks, Kirahana. That was wonderful. And also, thanks for the design tip. 10 meters, minimum 10 meters. 10 meters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's been two trees. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, but um, I think that was a wonderful discussion. Thank you again, Stephen and Gerhana, for your wonderful talk and also answering our questions. We hope to see you all again at our next webinar. Our next topic is who gets to build in our city and why? Take care, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.